It's winding down for the comrades. Saturday, November 7, the day just under 3,000 delegates of the People's National Party will select the sixth president of the 82-year-old party. Mark Jefferson Golding, the 55-year-old St. Andrew South Member of Parliament, will be on the ballot. But can he beat the St. Anne Southeastern MP, Lisa Hanna? Hello, I'm Damian Mitchell, and thank you for joining us for this special Gleaner Editors Forum. Joining us via Zoom, PNP leadership aspirant, Mark Golding. So, Mr. Golding, let's start right there. Can you beat Lisa Hanna? Yes, I can beat Lisa Hanna. Uh, we have been working hard on the ground. And as you know, we've been active in the media and social media to raise my profile. Up until a couple of weeks ago, I had never really put myself forward for any kind of national uh, position of leadership. But when I've seen what's happened to the party and the fact that Dr. Phillips is retiring, I decided that I had the skill set and the approach that was needed to lead the party forward at this time. So uh, with the work we've been doing, the response has been overwhelming and we're very confident of victory. Well, what is the basis of that confidence when opinion polls are showing that uh, Lisa Hanna is more favorable and she's also claiming that she has the majority support from, her, from MPs as well as councillors? Well, I think her arithmetic is a bit off when it comes to the MPs and councillors. But um, the main point is that the polls that you're referring to were done prior to I, I, uh, my entering the race. So it was at a time when I was really just one of many who are senior in the party, but wasn't really being considered for leadership. Since then, uh, since announcing that I am offering myself, uh, significant work has been done to make me better known to the wider society. I've been, you know, on numerous media engagements and social media has stepped up and I expect that the next poll when it's done will reflect um, the results of that effort. So, and as you know, it's not about a poll anyway, it's about who the delegates want to choose to lead the party. And the delegates are seasoned um, political uh, individuals who love their party and will be making the choice that they think is best for the future of the party. So well, they say that they in politics for a very long time, but you just have about two weeks left on the ground. Where are the areas you're focusing on now in respect of delegate support? The entire island. We're, we're not leaving anybody out. Uh, we're, we've, I've been meeting with delegates in, across the island and those meetings will continue and obviously making phone calls and so on, touching base. And that is a basis on which we're able to assess how we stand currently. And that is why I'm able to tell you I'm confident of victory because we are in touch with the delegates and we have um, you know, analyzed the responses and so on. And so that is a basis of our confidence. Well, you are a key figure in Peter Bunting's Rise United campaign. Are you being burned in any way by the sting of Bunting's failed leadership bid in 13 months ago against Peter Phillips? The approach I've been taking to the campaign is to stress the need for unity in the party. And we have put that unity into practice already. So if you look at the team of persons who are supporting me at the senior level, we have many persons who are not on the same side as me a year ago in that contest. As far as I'm concerned, and I think as far as the party should be concerned, that contest ended in September last year and is no longer relevant to what we're doing now. What we're trying to do is choose the right leader to take the party forward in unity. And in, in the team that I've comp um, compiled, my campaign chairman, my communications um, person, my road manager, and many, many others are all persons who last year weren't on the same side as I am. So I don't feel the legacy of that, co that contest is really affecting me adversely at this time, no. I note your word that that has ended and so it should not be a feature now. But in reality, it really is though, Mr. Golding, how are you seeking still to address those issues lingering since 13 months ago? Well, first of all, the message that I've come forth with is one that says that contest is at an end, which is a fact, and that there is no point or purpose or benefit 
from trying to carry those issues forward. The rise and the one PNP are really historical issues, but are no longer relevant in the party. So I've been saying that and I've said, we have to embrace each other with respect and love for each other as comrades and really bring the parts together under one big tent so that we can rally around a common purpose and move forward together. And that's the message and it's been resonating well. And that is why, you know, so many persons who were not on the same side as I was last year are now supporting me, many, many people, senior persons as well. So I'm very confident that the legacy of that contest uh, is, is really the historical memory of it. But in terms of how we move forward as a party, it's a new day, a new era, and it must be built around unity. Well, have you a space reserved for your inner circle for Peter Bunting, if you should become the next president of the PNP? Peter Bunting is my close friend, my business colleague for many years. Uh, I want him to play a role in the, in the party in the future because he has abilities and, and, and well recognized as such. He will be one of many who will play a role, I hope. I don't have any specific position for him in mind. We haven't discussed that. He's supporting my campaign. He wants me to put, go forward and he's, um, and he's encouraged me to do so, but not as his proxy or his agent, but as Mark Golding, an individual with experience, with competence and with integrity, who is delivering a message of hope for the party and one of unity and one of rebuilding the organization, strengthening our communications, strengthening our finances and building the party to the point where we can resume our mission in Jamaica House. Well, Norman Horn has indicated that he will not be taking up the Senate appointment just yet, saying that he hopes the new president of the People's National Party, who eventually will become opposition leader, will do so. And in fact, he wants to give that person the, the free reign to make that appointment. Are you considering if you should be elected PNP president to appoint Norman Horn, or will that be a Peter Bunting uh, seat for you? I'll make that decision when the time comes. There are a range of factors at play. I don't know who is interested in the Senate and who isn't. And furthermore, there's a, a, when we configure the Senate, there's a certain image and a range of constituencies that you want to cover. And I, when I use the word constituencies, I don't mean political constituencies, but rather democratic constituencies. So when the time comes, we'll consider that matter. But just to be clear, you have not ruled out Peter Bunting as a potential appointee if you should become president and opposition leader? I haven't ruled that out or ruled it in. Yes. Well, what are your concerns though, Mr. Golding, with, resp with respect to the constitution of the People's National Party? Well, there are two aspects to that. I think one aspect is that the constitution and the structures that it provides for need to be made to work as they were designed to work. And we've seen over the years that we haven't really put enough effort, I think, into some aspects of the, the structures and, and making sure that they're delivering what the party needs from them. On the other hand, I think the constitution needs some reform. And I've already said publicly that one of the things I'd like to see is we move away from a system which is like an electoral college uh, where uh, groups appoint a person, to, a, a member to vote at conference and we give the franchise the voting rights, full delegate status to all members of the party. I believe that one member, one vote is a better system. It's more democratic and it will reduce some of the practices that people complain about, which have crept in into internal elections, because I think we'll have a much bigger body of persons who are making the decision. So I would support a constitutional reform along those lines. Well, we have several questions coming in from social media, but Laverne Barrett, our reporter, is also uh, in the panel, and he has a couple questions for you. Just two questions from me, really. One, what do you make of the blowback from social media to the endorsement by Mr. Matalan? I'm not sure what the blowback is. I think that this, it has raised an interesting point. Uh, which I think is worthy of further debate going forward as to the circumstances in which an individual at whatever level of the society has a right to express a preference for somebody seeking an, a public office. And I think that that is an important right that individuals in Jamaica have as a robust democracy. On the other hand, obviously as the position he holds, there are 
issues that arise from that. And I believe he has discussed that with the Board of the Clean and it's really a matter internal to them. So I don't want to personally get into it. Uh, he, he chose to endorse me as did the other persons who did. It was really based on a personal relationship. I've known him for many years. We're friends. We, I've also done legal work for his group of companies. He knows the person I am, my capacity for work, my intellectual ability and so on. And he chose to give that endorsement, which is really his right. My understanding is that the Greener has a clear separation between editorial matters and corporate board matters. He's on the corporate board side. He's not on the editorial side. And uh, he felt that there was nothing wrong with him professing um, his support for me. And he wasn't supporting the People's National Party when he did so. He was supporting Mark Golding, stepping forth for a leadership position in the country. And I think he said, if, even if I was a, a member of another party, he would have done the same thing because of his relationship with me. Was it, was it requested, the, the endorsement, or was it offered? I didn't request it. I didn't arrange it, and I didn't request it. Okay, my, my other question is, in terms, the, 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 the word has been unity and unifying the, the, the party going forward. Are you not concerned by some of the utterances coming from um, Dayton Campbell, who, was, who is supporting you? Just this morning, I read on social media where one person was saying, and I won't go into the details of what was said, but essentially is saying that the comments being made by, by um, Mr. Campbell in whatever, in, I think in social media, really challenges that attempt by the party to, to remain unified. I don't know what specific comments you're referring to, Laverne. The one that I'm aware of was a comment that was made in a meeting uh, which was reported in an, another newspaper. And I spoke with Dayton about that, and I said to him, look, I understood the broader point he was making, which was that resources are important for any political movement to be able to carry out its organizational work. That was a broad point he was making, and it was a solid point. There was nothing wrong with it. But in the course of making it, he made a flippant remark in jest, which was picked up by the newspaper. And I think I, I, that was an inappropriate comment for him to make, and I told him as much. And we left it there, you know. So I don't know what other issues they're raising. Uh, it's, we're in a time where persons will try and make mountains out of molehills and even fabricate things and so on. So I'm not really going to comment on something I'm not aware of. The one I am aware of, I've addressed already as the leader of this campaign. Thank well, you thank you very much uh, for that, Liver, and thank you very much, Mr. Golding. Here is a question coming in on Twitter from Comrade Richie. He says, what is the plan to engage these 62% of Jamaicans that have given up on the hope that the government works in their interest? First of all, we have to unify the party because I think of a party that is perceived as not being united is not an attractive organization to the 62%. So the first order of business is for us to deliberately embrace the idea of a family within the party and that we're all moving towards a common purpose. Secondly, I think we need to articulate what that common purpose is in the 21st century and what the core message is that we're bringing to the Jamaican people and formulate policies which address the remaining fundamental issues that the Jamaica Labour Party government is not tackling in education and in the economy and elsewhere and come with a message around that which is clear and compelling and that um, the Jamaican people will recognize is addressing the core problems of our country. And I think that when we do that, under, the, under Mark Golding's leadership, somebody who is regarded as trustworthy and honest, somebody who has a reputation for competence, who has strong relationships in the, the business community from many years of service and business activity there, somebody who is respected as a professional and somebody who in his constituency has shown love and care for the people and has built a strong constituency out of what was already a solid PNP constituency. I think at the end of the day, um, that is what is going to bring the people who have stayed away from the political process back to the People's National Party. A credible message with relevant policies, with a, um, with a leadership that is trustworthy and who re is relatable as somebody who can be relied on to deliver on their word. Well, let's stick with that a bit because the matter of what happened in the West, the People's National Party essentially lost the entire West 
in the September 3 general election. Janet Silvera is online. She is from the West, but just before she comes in, what is your plan to regain the West in particular? We have to really focus on rebuilding the organization of the party and especially the base. The West is um, traditionally a strong area for us, but I think that we have not focus sufficiently on ensuring that our, our party workers are fully motivated and well-trained and educated around the political matters. So we need to bring political education back to the center of the party with training and supported by life skills so that being members of groups and so on uh, is, a, is a dynamic process that the communities in which our, our base live can see the benefits of being part of the People's National Party. So we need to revitalize the groups and we need to revitalize political education and training on the ground and, and support that process with appropriate incentives and so on and make it fun to be a part of a group. I think it at sounds that point- It sounds to me that you are having a one size fit all. Are you not concerned that some of the constituencies where the PNP have lost or has lost uh, some traction, there needs to be specific uh, vaccines for those constituencies? Well, you asked me a general question about the West. Um, yes. So I don't think the West is um, different from the East or the Center in terms of the need to strengthen the organization of the party. Now, in particular constituencies, yes, there may be a need for a uh, change of leadership there or further support from the party or other matters that may, may be some divisions that need to be healed on a case-by-case -case basis. Yes, there would need to be specific actions taken. Very well. Let's turn to Janet Silvera, who is in the West. Janet? Thank you very much, Damian. Good, mo um, good morning, Mr. Golding. Morning, Mr. Silvera. I'm from, a, you know, I'm from a city where we have probably the largest number of inner city communities. I would like you to share your vision for the development of inner city communities in Jamaica. And while you're at it, if you could tell me what your experience has been with this in your own constituency, I would appreciate that. That's question number one. And number two, while I'm at it, being the tourism writer at the Gleaner, I'd like to find out from you what, it is, what is your vision for the cultural industries and the marketing of Jamaica, Jamaican talent, in the post-COVID moment? Okay, those are two big questions, Ms. Silvera. So <laughs> on the, in relation to the inner cities, my experience of the inner cities is that the divide in Jamaica is still real in terms of the delivery of basic amenities and services. So you, typically in inner city communities, you find that garbage collection is inadequate, you find that street lighting is inadequate, which enhances a sense of insecurity. Often there are in infrastructural challenges around water and sewage and so on. And then often there's not enough investment in the community so that businesses can grow there and, and tr try and create a more nurturing environment for small business so that we can have economic development reaching the people in those communities. So my vision for the inner city is that we, significantly significant increase the investment in, in in housing in those areas housing stock is often deplorable old and needs to and we need to empower residents to um, fix up their homes and improve their their living standards and in the last manifesto that was one of the proposals that we had i think that we need to also strengthen the delivery of those those amenities that, that i referred to garbage disposal so people, uh, and street lighting, so people feel that they're living in a community where the state cares for the basic level of living in um, which any citizen should enjoy. And I think those are vital things. And also we have to really find better ways or more effective ways of delivering the kind of economic support to small business in those communities so that entrepreneurs who are there and there are many, many um, dynamic entrepreneurs in inner cities have more support, whether it be access to finance or technical support to help them grow their businesses. And I've been doing that in my own constituency uh, and I'm already seeing the results of that. In terms of tourism and the creative industries, Ms. Silvera, I believe we have to strengthen the linkages between the wider um, 
economy and tourism. And one critical area is around craft, for example. I think that the craft industry needs to be given greater support so that they are, there's more diversity in their product and some of the traditional craft products are promoted and they have an opportunity to sell into the tourism, um, into the tourist resorts. We also, I think, need to um, give more support to the local entertainment industry. I think that we have too many hotels that have been using foreign entertainment and I don't see any need for that. We can provide very um, compelling and, uh, and exciting entertainment packages locally. I think we need to really reconsider allowing foreign entertainers to be the ones providing entertainment services in our hotels. And in generally in the creative industries in the country, we need to support them. We need to provide entertainment zones where um, persons can perform live to audiences and, and where we can have a, a dynamic nightlife around live entertainment. And I think also things like college radios and so on, radio stations, we need to sponsor radio programming with Jamaican music so that the, the, in those markets in the US, US and, and Europe and so on, they can hear more of the contemporary as well as the older Jamaican music and continue to um, develop their love and passion for it. So they, they, I, th that's a range of some of the things I would suggest need to be done to really enhance the cultural and creative industries and their linkages with tourism. Thank you very much. Uh, time is flying by so very fast. We're almost out of time for this segment of this special Lena Editors Forum with PNP leadership aspirant, Mark Golding. But I must ask you, Mr. Golding, the rollout of your presidential campaign seems to be so much more robust than that of the PNP for the September 3 general election. How much did you hold back? I didn't hold back anything because to be perfectly honest, I wasn't anticipating going into any sort of leadership race. So, uh, you know, I, I was very focused in the general election on my own constituency. I wanted to do well. And happily, I was able to increase my votes by I think 1,600 or thereabouts and ended up with the largest margin and the most number of votes of any PNP candidate. So I was really focused on doing my job as an MP, Damien. I also provided financial support to, M to other candidates who asked for it and to the region, Region 3, where I am, which is a pink corporate area, I gave them some support, and to the YO, who had asked for some support for them to go out into the field and do their thing. So I did what I could. You know, I, I, fin financing my own constituency um, campaign was, took, took some resources from me as well. So now, having put myself in the ring and, and stepping forward for leadership, persons have come on board who appreciate what I've done and want to support it. And, you know, it's an overwhelming um, wave of support for it. And so we have been able to conduct a robust campaign so far. And that is well, here's a question from Pat Green. She is also on social media and she's asking, how will you seek to raise funds for the PNP should you win? given that this is your second term in opposition? Well, first of all, I think the PNP needs to show itself to be a party that is rebuilding and a party that is um, t doing the necessary things to become a, a strong political force that can resume its mission of uh, empowerment to the Jamaican people. So in order to attract financing, you have to show that you have your act together, and that you're moving forward in a way that is likely to be successful. That success breeds success and it breeds support. I have strong linkages from years of, of service in the, in the private sector, in the business community, and I expect to get support from them as we did when I was treasurer in 2009. I'll be working closely with the party treasurer and the finance committee to try and um, shore up the, the financial base of the party. We also need to reach out to the diaspora more you know, we have supporters in the UK, the US and Canada and elsewhere, that, and we need to reach out to them and, and widen the financial base of the party that way. And there's also a possibilities for crowdfunding and so on, where persons who want to support us can uh, contribute smaller sums, which, you know, every mickle make a muckle. And myself and Pat, Patricia Sutherland, who are, who's on this call, have had some experience of trying that. And that is something I think we can revisit. All the best to you, Mr. Golding. And Thank we you, look sir. forward to talking with your opponent come tomorrow.